we're about to get super science-y, so buckle in for that. Please welcome to the stage Leslie Dewan from Transatomic Power and Jacob DeWitt from UPower Technologies, along with our moderator, Samantha O'Keefe. Go ahead, you can clap. Hi. So, Leslie and Jake, thanks for joining us today. So, to get started, a lot of people would say that there's not a lot of activity in nuclear. You could call it maybe a stagnant industry. What's the backstory here on why the U.S. isn't bringing more reactors online? So, to get to that, um, I'm going to jump back in time 50 years ago. A little bit. So like in the 1950s and the 1960s, there was so much excitement surrounding new nuclear reactors. People had this, this blue sky sense of all of the new interesting things you could do with the technology. And then that persisted for 10 years, 20 years, and then Three Mile Island happened. Then Chernobyl happened. And all of the engineers who could left the industry, and very few new engineers joined the industry after that. So that followed for decades of stagnation since the 70s and since the 1980s. And it's only recently that the industry has been picking up in numbers and recovering and just getting the, the additional manpower to start pursuing those older technologies again. So Jake, is it we have more nuclear engineers? Is that why we see this activity now? I think that's part of it. I think that's a big part, actually. I think it's also the interest level that the new engineers bring, frankly. Um, I was classmates with Leslie at MIT, and you know, that group of people in our class were excited about nuclear in a different way. Um, and I think that passion is carried through to looking at it sort of with a fresh perspective. In, in what different way was that? Why is there this urgency now? I think there's a couple things. I think it's because some kids grew up playing SimCity like myself <laughs> and uh, got frustrated but realized that nuclear was a cool power source or fusion was an option. But I also think it's really because the technology is fascinating and also the potential it has for basically making, you know, improving the world. Climate concerns, energy poverty alleviation, those are all things nuclear can do really well. Yeah, so nuclear has a lot of promise. We hear from the industry about potential environmental impacts. We move away from oil, we move into these alternative methods. But there are a lot of concerns about the waste produced from these plants and the safety of the plants themselves. How is the technology both of your companies are using addressing these? So I think that if you want to make a successful new reactor technology, a successful advanced reactor, you have to address the safety issues and the waste issues and the cost issue head on. And I think that's something that all of the advanced reactor techs, what Jake is working on, what I'm working on, that's what we do. You have to find a way to make the reactors safer. You have to find a way to either produce less waste or even um, consume some of the existing stockpiles of used nuclear fuel. So you can show people that what used to be a problem in some of the, the early parts of the industry can now be addressed with this new technology. And so at Transatomic, it's my understanding that you are using some of this waste. Can you explain how, you know, keeping in mind we're all not nuclear engineers, how does this technology work? <laughs> yep, I'll give the 30-second, the one-minute version. <laughs> so one of the crazy things is that there's a tremendous amount of energy that's left in used nuclear fuel. The conventional reactors can only use about 3 or 4% of the energy you could conceivably get out of it. And molten salt reactors, like what Transatomic is developing, we can consume a very large fraction, up to about 96% of the remaining energy that's in the used nuclear fuel. And so one, um, one cool number to put on it is that if you um, take all of the world's stockpiles of used nuclear fuel, all 270,000 metric tons of it, and extract most of its remaining energy, that would be enough electricity to power the entire world for about 72 years, even taking into account increasing demand. So what we want to do, what all of us want to do, is find a way to uh, reframe, to, to think about nuclear waste in a new way, to start viewing it as a resource to be tapped rather than a liability to be disposed of. So you've got a molten salt reactor. Jake, U Power has something different, right? Right. So we're building a very small reactor. Uh, it's a fast reactor that has no moving parts and is cooled purely by natural forces. Um, and it 
sort of take advantage of some of the history and legacy from the successful programs that Idaho did at EBR2 and some of those reactors that demonstrated some amazing capabilities. And uh, like Leslie said, what some of these advanced reactor technologies can do is tap into the tremendous potential of energy in nuclear waste. So something that we view as waste is, like she said, a resource. It's an asset. And um, on top of that, you know, when you mine uranium out of the ground, about one in every 140 atoms of uranium is fissile. So when we enrich it, we discard a lot of what is called, well, fertile uranium-238, which isn't directly usable. But you can, in these advanced reactors, actually take that, put it in reactors, and convert it to a useful fuel and extract energy from it. So really, there's enough uranium on the US side between the spent nuclear fuel and depleted uranium that's been pulled out and left over from enrichment that you could power the entire US for like a thousand years on that. And I mean, it's, that fuel exists now. It's out of the ground. So it's a really phenomenal asset that we have. Yeah, and your technology is kind of radically different than what we think of as a nuclear reactor or power plant because you have a different end user. Right. Who is who's that person? So when we started this, our vision was looking at how can we build advanced reactors and get them to market. And one of the concerns we saw was utilities' reluctance to buy first-of-a-kind technology. So we realized, well, we're going to have to build small stuff along the way to making it bigger. But then we kind of asked the question, well, could we sell the small stuff? Could we build something people want at that size? And we realized that on the off-grid markets, there actually is a huge potential. So if you think about places like remote communities in Canada or Alaska, or even in the US, to around the world, um, places that rely on diesel generators right now account for about $300 billion in annual energy expenditures. Um, and we can go in and immediately cut their costs in about half or more compared to diesel. And uh, I just, it's amazing, but you know, diesel is the most energy dense liquid fuel for fossil fuel that they have. Uh, Nuclear is 2 million times as energy dense. So it's just kind of a better offering. And, um, and our concept was to say, okay, if we build something like that, we got to do something very simple, very robust. So it's, you know, doesn't have any moving parts in the reactor block, it can operate you know, right side up, sideways, upside down, underwater, in space. There's a lot of neat potential you can do with it and um, opens up some neat use cases that are kind of different than what's been done before. Yeah, nuclear in space, I'm sure a lot of people are really excited about that. Hey, if we're going to get to Mars, <laughs> that's the best way to get there. Yeah, so even with the small reactor design, even with these advanced reactor designs, people are emotional, right? They don't want to live next to these facilities or near the waste that they produce. How do you guys think about getting past that public perception so that you can install this somewhere? So I think a lot of it can be addressed head on with the features of the new technology that are being developed. So one key thing is that both of our reactors, though they're different varieties, both of them operate at atmospheric pressure. So unlike some of the reactors that exist today, there's no driving force to push any material beyond the site boundary. So you can have a worst case scenario accident, but it's still confined to the site itself. And one other big thing about that too is they look differently, right? And yeah, like exactly. Leslie has a great picture of what their reactor could look like on their website. Um, they look differently and people have a different reaction when something looks cool and futuristic and not like kind of the stereotypical appearance that they have. And so we're gonna make them look better. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a big piece. <laughs> I think, I think there's difference. some interesting potential, actually, for using um, the different architecture, the different civil engineering that's made possible by the different technological characteristics to um, give people a new way of, of interacting with this. And I think another piece, just, just to say quickly, like you can, you can sell people on the new technological benefits, but a really important piece is to show the, the environmental benefits as well. So my company's technology, um, we went, um, we're kind of addressing the, the other piece of the market from what Jake's company is doing. So we're looking at large scale facilities around 520 megawatts electric, ones that will be the right size to replace the coal power plants that are coming offline in the US and serve as an alternative for the coal power plants that are being built worldwide. So if you can say, look, we have an environmentally friendly alternative to coal. We have a scalable carbon-free source of electricity that you can use in parallel with solar and wind and hydro and geothermal as a viable part of the portfolio. I think that's something that you can, you can show as a real tangible benefit for people worldwide. 
And I'm just, that's one thing Leslie said is very important. Nuclear with renewables work yeah. very well together. Solar, wind, nuclear, they all work really well together. The idea that it's one versus the other is, is very, um, it's just not really accurate. So you can do some great things by putting those together and actually really decarbonize and lower electricity bills. So it's a big win-win. Yeah. What are the biggest misconceptions you hear when people talk about nuclear? I'll, I think the two that we hear the most of are the wayside, um, kind of not really understanding how much there is. It's a very small amount relative to how much energy has come out, as well as the fact that it's not really waste. It's a big asset. And then the other is, is on the uh, sort of safety side and understanding what really happened at some of the accidents that gave the industry a blemish. Um, you know, they weren't as bad as I think they were made out to be in the public hysteria of what happened. Mm -hmm. And then people sometimes forget that. Do you think this could be a generational thing? People that experience those accidents have a hesitancy. Maybe the younger generation, like the nuclear engineers, are more for it. Is that something you're banking on? I think in some ways that, that helps a lot. I think the other thing is the Cold War was the other overshadowing effect um, for you know, our parents' generation. Um, but yeah, you, you know, our generation has, a, I think, a fresh approach. Also, you know, the internet helps a lot, generally, because you can get access to information um, that's accurate and transparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to build on that a little bit, I think that one of the things that the nuclear industry and nuclear engineers individually need to do is be extremely open about explaining their technology, very transparent and very forthright. And the internet, as Jake said, helps that tremendously. Online you can say, all right, this is, this is how everything works. This is what the specs will look like. This is, this is how, I hope it to move for how I hope it will move forward in the future. And that, that level of, of engagement directly with people is exactly what the industry needs. Yeah, so more transparency, more information is yeah. what I'm hearing. So let's jump to the regulatory environment. I think this is where most people, even if they're on board with your technology, they're like, is this going to work? It, at TechCrunch, we hear a lot about the 1099 economy. That's a regulatory hurdle for startups to get over. But if I put that in one hand, and then I put you know, the NRC and the nuclear re regulation process on the other, they're not even in the same league. So as a founder, how are you thinking about getting these products to market built given that maze? So right now in the US, there's, um, there's a, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of ambiguity in the nuclear regulatory process. There are a few different pathways that nuclear reactors can use. Some of them are different for smaller reactors than for bigger reactors. Um, but really, it, by most estimations, it's something that will take five years, 10 years, uh, one group said 20 years to get a new type of advanced reactor licensed. It could take $10 million, it could take $100 million, it could take $5 million. And it's almost, it's not so much the large dollar amounts, but it's the, the large uncertainty in the timeline and in the cost, depending on which pathway that you could potentially go down that makes it extremely tricky. There's some good progress on that front that's been happening very recently, even over the past year, even over the past three months. There's been a lot of really thoughtful, positive movement forward um, with the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Department of Energy. So things are being sorted out. <laughs> so still up in the air, tantalizingly. I think um, for us, one of the things that we've tried to focus on is how do we control the regulatory process as best as possible. And so our philosophy is you, we just kind of to borrow from Nike, just do it, just get through it. Um, in the sense that there are s a lot of misunderstandings and, and kind of misconceptions about the N Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You know, it's not impossible to get a license. Um, they do have a successful legacy with uh, advanced reactors. Um, and the costs typically haven't been as high as what people have sometimes thought they would be um, in the direct, you know, billable to the NRC. The process is really, you know, and they've done actually a good job of setting up provisions to get advanced reactors through, but it, it's still not well established to basically support a startup, right? Mm -hmm. Support a staged milestone kind of approach. And so what we're trying to do is fit in what the provisions that they have are now, which is to drive the process with testing. Um, and that's what we've just mostly focused on, building the best team we can of engineers and regulatory engineers to build and test things at scale 
provide that foundational data to then basically take it to the regulatory body and say, hey, look, this is our system. It's based, you know, what do you want to do with it? What do you want to see as far as performance? And you know, really the process gets down to them saying, okay, it behaves like you expect it to, safely like you expect it to, mm -hmm. and then they give you approval. And so we're really focusing on the testing and doing that. And we've tried to leverage proven materials and fuels to really help us expedite that process. But um, you know, one of the hardest parts about it is the fact that it doesn't present to you this upfront process that you can go to without formulating that process with them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the challenges. But you know, you just kind of have to move and make this stuff happen ultimately. Does it help that you're working with a smaller reactor? Does that make it easier? It does. So like we're building a full scale, exact scale electrically heated prototype that'll be operational in about a month, which is really nice. And it helps being small to do that. Um, and it's nice because then that's literally what our reactor is going to look like. It just minus the nuclear part, which is actually really well proven out. So we just go show them that. And it, it really does help um, manage that process. Yeah. And I think both of you mentioned building on existing materials or tests that have been pre-approved from the 50s. Are you using that at Transatomic? That's exactly right. There's actually a really similar type of molten salt reactor that was built and tested at the Oak Ridge National Lab back in the late 1960s. So they showed that it worked. They showed that it had tremendous safety benefits. Just at the time, it was it was too expensive. Um, so what we're able to do, we changed two of the key materials in the reactor to make it much more compact, cheaper, able to run on the nuclear waste while still keeping the same safety benefits. So our tests right now, we have some test loops currently operational that are looking at, well, all right, what are, what are the properties of these new materials under the radiation conditions, at the high temperatures, under the, the corrosive conditions within the system? So. To get through this process, it's going to take some money, even if you can navigate it correctly. And you've both raised money um, from some very reputable people, Founders Fund, Venrock, Sam Altman, I believe, is on your board, Jake. Do you just go up to these people and say, hi, I'd like to build a nuclear reactor. Can I have some money? In some ways. <laughs> um, in some ways. I think it's interesting is that people a lot of the investors out here, and I think that we've both raised from, are interested in how do you make a product better than what is the alternative today. And nuclear has a lot of potential for that. And there's a lot of people in the Bay Area, excuse me, investors specifically, who see that. And um, you know, so when you approach them, I think there's a lot of positive receptiveness to what you're doing. But there's concerns, of course, mostly on the timelines and some of the financial risk that comes from regulatory pieces. But um, you know, in our experience, the whole story was, look, we're just going to focus on you know, going forward with testing, make stuff, test it, and then try to go as fast as we can and kind of focusing on a market that has sort of a different customer use and I would say profile. Also the fact that we can partner with utilities in a way that we're not selling them something, but that they're working with us. It kind of helps as far as guiding through how that works. Um, and you just have to ultimately say, look, these are the relevant mi milestones. This is what's important, and that's why we're focusing on hitting those as part of our fundraising strategy and plan. But you're right; it does it does take significant capital. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so maybe not for every investor. Right. How do your investors think about Leslie the the time horizon that you guys are working on? Yeah, that's one of the tricky things in nuclear is that it can take a long time to get a commercial scale facility up and running. Um, one of the interesting things that I realized recently about the majority of Transatomics investors is that a lot of them are um, billionaires with PhDs in physics or nuclear engineering. So that's, um, I feel like at some point we should, we should broaden out to people who are beyond that very narrow category. <laughs> I think that's true for, for several of your investors yeah, as well, Jake. Um, so what's nice is that um, uh, our main investor, Peter Thiel's Founders Fund, they're structured in a way so that they have um, they can have longer timelines. So they were an early investor in SpaceX, and when, when we talked to them about our, our timeline, our capital needs, they said, oh, all right, that's familiar to us. That's how long it took uh, the Falcon 9 to get off the ground, for example. So there are some VC funds that are set up to, to handle these longer time horizon, bigger impact investments. And then um, several of our other investments are from um, family funds who want generational investments, and energy is an incredibly good space for that type of generational investment. So quickly, 30 seconds, 
What's the best, best case scenario for where the industry is in five years? In five years, we've built our reactor. Leslie's built her reactor, at least prototypes of it at least, and uh, there's probably a couple others doing that. We're operating them, and we're in the process of scaling that out commercially for massive deployment. I think that's very doable. It's very doable. Excellent. Well, best of luck to you both. We look forward to seeing those. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.